I will directly go to my topic because I have so I will short time. So on behalf of my department, I am presenting this topic renal transplantation. It's a big arena, but it's very difficult for me to cover uh, you within this 20 minutes time. Uh, I will go fast because I have to give lots of information, but still I know that the, our audience is uh, PG residents, uh, general surgery residents, so I will speak up to the basic things. So I may be giving you a few uh, details, but I will also give you what are the things you must read. You have to go back to your uh, books and you have to read certain things regarding the renal transplantation. We all know that um, he is the one who got transplanted in our Hindu mythology and he is the surgeon. Because we know that uh, uh, the concept of transplantation exists, dates back. And still this book from uh, Billy and Love, which is our back uh, bone of our surgical practice, also describes lots of transplantation works being done. Here I would like to uh, tell you something about the definitions. Before going into the transplantation, there are few things that you must know. Is uh, definition of few of the words. I think you must be knowing these things. The first one is autograph because when any organs or some tissue is taken from the same individuals and transplanted somewhere else, it is known as the autograph. Isograph is considered the graft which is taken, this transplantation being done between two identical uh, individuals. They are usually the identical twins. Allograph is uh, when the transplantation is done between same species that from one person to another person from a homo sapiens to homo sapiens is called allograph and genograph is from animals. We have been thinking about to produce lots of valve, okay, uh, hard valve from the porcine models and they are usually considered the genograph. You should be also be knowing about what is autotopic transplant and what is heterotropic transplant because these are different. When you are putting the organ at the same anatomical space, it is causing orthotopic transplant. If you are doing liver transplant, usually liver are kept at the same anatomical place, so it will be the orthotopic. But the kidney, when you are doing transplant, you are keeping it somewhere else in the retrospective area and reasons. So they are considered as the heterotopic. Uh, I should not uh, uh, emphasize on this slide because we all know that transplantation is a teamwork and there are lots of involvement from all of the departments. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that why this transplantation is technically complex. Why the people tell you lots of things about this transplantation? Because there are many key factors, issues involved in this. Uh, I think one of the uh, most complex things is the surgical technique. Obviously, that organ which was harvested from a donor has to be reperfused in the recipient, so it is a challenging topic. Second is that, is that the organ from the donor, from the human product, is not manufactured in the laboratories, it's not like a drug. So these are really dealt with very caution. Surgeons are really distressed when they are dealing with the very vicious organs from the donors. So it's a technically challenge for the surgeons who are doing transplantation. And the third most, the most challenging part is the dissection. You know, when you are putting this L antigens to the recipient's body, this is the some things the antigenics from others' bodies, the body, the defense mechanism always wants to push that organs away. It's called the rejection. So dealing with the rejection is very complex. That, that's why when we're talking about the transplantations, we have to be seeing all these things, the surgical challenge, preciousness of those organs and the rejection part. Uh, we all know that uh, if you go by Love and Billy, you have mentioned, described very nicely about this, uh, this rejection process. So what are the antigens, immune antigens, HLA, all the minus antigens. Uh, you also know about HLA, class 1 and class 2 antigens where they are very specific for the organ transplantations. And these slides must be followed when you are asked about the rejection process. You should be knowing how this interleukin 2 is activate the CD4 T cells and these antigen present T cells in the allograms will help to produce the nature, activate the nature in the cells, then will be direct T cells activations and then will be destruction of the tissues, endothelial injuries causing thrombosis, as well as in the long run they form antibody organs the antigens. So these are the process, complex process which always 
push this organs away from the recipients and this is the process where the uh, anti rejection treatments help. We know that when organ is transplanted to the recipient's body, there are three types of reactions which is known as the type of graft rejections, which is known as acute, uh, hyper acute, acute and chronic. We all know that immediately during the transplantation, if the graft is rejected, that is because of the hyper acute rejections and it is because of the preform antibody in the body. But now we have lots of uh, investigations and facilities available to check whether the recipient will have preform antibody against the uh, antigen which are going to, we are going to expose or not. So how to prevent this uh, rejection is very important. When you are asked about these things, so we have to take care of the ABO compatibility, we have to see for the HLA matchings, tissue cross match and anti rejection therapies. These are the key points where the transplant, uh, these anti rejection therapies need to play. Uh, this is one point, oh, this is out of the scope of this my topic, but you should be how I should read about these anti-rejection therapies, immunotherapies, because you may be asked about what are the classification of anti-rejection therapies. So you must be knowing what are the calcium immune blockers like uh, um, cyclophosphamide, uh, tacrolimus. So how does they help in preventing rejections? So then you may be asked about this pathogenesis and lots of side effects, common side effects. I think uh, our residents who work with us at teaching hospital because we have been doing radio transfer for the last 10 years and they might be knowing about in detail about these drugs, doses and uh, side effects. Uh, I request other residents also to clear their exams, at least sometimes the external the theory or sometimes they may come up with this uh, anti rejection therapies and they might be asking these side effects. So to my topic proper, with this background, so I would like to start about the renal transplantations and a bit history on the transplant is quite interesting that the first successful renal transplantation was done by Joseph Murray in Boston, USA in the year of 1954. So that time he, one of the identical twins was, he was suffering from CKD and his brother identical twins were related to this. It was a Christmas Eve, he was having a festivals with the families which were, um, and he was called by the hospital, there was a CKD patient was there and they are going to start a history, they are going to make a history. And the doctor Joseph Murray did a first successful transplantation. If it had not been the identical twin, he might have to have rejections and after that lots of transplantation has been done and there was so much of rejection in that time. It's only after 54 years of successful transplantations, it's at Namai Hospital and TVTS in 2008, we started the first successful TV transplant programs and it is being continued till right now and we have almost completed more than 500 transplants till now with a good success rate. Uh, this is a historical picture. I always want to put this is after our first successful transplant at our hospital. So when we are talking about this transplantation, I think there are three domains. Uh, one is the recipient because of transplantations, all this story starts with the recipient. Someone is having uh, kidney failure and he needs that organ in place. There are lots of uh, um, renal replacement therapies like dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, but I think the best form of renal replacement treatment is the kidney transplant and we all should agree about it. Second, then we need to see for donors from where these organs is retrieved or procured. So, thank God we have a pair of kidneys in everyone and I think God has given one extra. So we can share those extra organs. When the near and dear one is suffering from the disease, so anyone can donate. Uh, but this all has to be within legal limits. I have discussed a few legal aspects as well during this thing. And the third most part is the technical teams. It depends on the hospitals and with their surgeons, physicians who are working on this. So who is the ideal recipient? Because we all know that the CKD patients with a stage 4 or 5, exactly these are the group of patients they are already is so compromised that he is not able to maintain his pre level and they are the group of recipients. Uh, residents should know about uh, what is the absolute contraindications for the uh, uh, kidney recipients, uh, kidney transplantations and those recipients contraindications are systemic malignancies, active infections. Although this seropositive HIV hepatitis B is considered as absolute contraindication but now it's become relative now. So people are doing transplant in HIV patients and hepatitis B positive patients. Non-compliant patients obviously if the patient is not committed for the lifelong drug, drug treatment of anti 
injection therapy, then he is not a candidate for transplantation. And obviously the substance dependence patient. So on these three um, associations, I think the donor is the most important part on the kidney transplantations and we should be very respectful to, 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 for to, to those donors. And those donors can be live relatives and those kidneys can be harvested or procured through the cadaveric way. When the patient dies, all as a brain dead conditions, the patient might be in uh, ICUs with ventilatory supports, his heart might be beating, but uh, the patient is no longer to survive and is brain dead. death. There are criterias to consider the brain dead and those can be a good donor for a kidneys. And there are patients who are, there are the, the capital punishment given uh, prisoners who these can be also be the donors in some countries. So, basic principle is that the kidney donors should be physically fit. Uh, he should be legally acceptable because the legality is different in different countries and he should be a volunteer. There should not be any pressures or some motives behind the donation. So, are there any protocols to consider the evaluation of these donors or um, criteria to call a fit donors? Because there are lots of debates, there are lots of um, criteria are set. One of the criteria is set in Amsterdam in 2004 and it was published in 2005 and this was considered one of the main landmark paper in the evaluation of the kidney donors. So it is, if you have a time you can go with this Amsterdam criteria and you should know about what are the criteria for a, a kidney donors. This is what we never expect. So these are the few of the stories regarding the organ trade and I think as a surgeon we should always discourage these things. We also might be heard hearing lots of story about our Oxe village in Nepal also people are poor and these things as a happening but we should be committed against this act. So donor and recipients are evaluated in the hospital in a detailed way and uh, they all are admitted at least two days prior to the operations and this anti-rejection treatment is started. So when you are talking, I am not a nephrologist and I am not opening this topic but at least you should know that the anti-rejection treatment starts with the inductions. So usually they use uh, anti-thymocytic globulin or antibodies like the acuzumab for the inductions and they maintain with the three drugs like uh, uh, one is calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin or tacrolimus or antiproliferative agents like mycophenyl mephotin and steroids. So in our hospitals we have a protocol of three drugs. So we give inductions for a few doses and then we maintain it. Then we also have a final assessment for fitness of anesthesia and the legal perspective. So when we are evaluating the donors for a kidney donor, especially few investigations that I would like to highlight, you should know about the spiral CT renal angiography. When you have a multi-axial, multi-slice CT scans now, it's non-invasive angiography is possible. So we are using CT scan for angiographic evaluation of this patient because we know that when you are harvesting a kidney and doing the transplant, we are anastomosing renal artery, renal vein and ureter. So we must be knowing all its detail beforehand and it's also help us to choose the donors which side to take or not. Similarly, we also perform the diuretic renograms, TGP renogram, which is for the differential function as well. So these are few of the examples of multiple renal artery that exactly that actually exist. So I am uh, going to have one paper. We have already completed 500 donors and we are coming with the renal artery um, anomalies and all these things among the Nepalese donors and this paper is coming in within 6 months time. Second is multiple renal arteries. When we have such renal arteries multiples on both sides, it poses a big surgical technical challenge to us. Uh, we all know that in Nepal, we all are practicing this transplantation according to our legal aspects. You know, they are all in Nepal Raspatraman, these who have been published. Uh, to be in short, um, legal has been legalized in Nepal from 2000 to 2000. There are already two law has been passed, but it takes eight hours for us to try to get a um, uh, clearance from the ministry. So it's in 2008 we got uh, this legal clearance and in the teaching hospital we started the transplantation. After that, the same services started at the hospital and at the um, organ transplant center. The 
the kidney is retrieved uh, by the open donor nephrectomy or the laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. If anyone asks you which is a gold standard treatment, always it's a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy is a gold standard treatment. But still we are doing open nephrectomy uh, and uh, hopefully you know, we also pass ahead and we will we'll start with this laparoscopic um, donor nephrectomy quite soon and that scar can be avoided. Uh, Usually it's on a flank position is being done and the lateral surface coastal incision is uh, given um, and we use the extra peritoneal aphros uh, is used to harvest the kidney and preferentially if the both kidney are suitable we will take the left side. There are reasons why we choose the left side because the resonance should know. It's depend upon the anatomy of the vascularity and the blood drainage from the kidney. Left renal vein is longer. Left renal vein is surrounded by less important, uh, important uh, structures. So during the dissection, there is less chance of injury to the surrounding structure as well. So it's basically the long left renal vein which makes it suitable uh, for us to harvest the left side kidney. So one thing that I would like to highlight is while we are doing the dissection, this triangle which is known as the golden triangle, which is very very important that you try need to preserve this triangle. You should not try to divide the fats and make this ureter devascularized. As you know, the upper part of the ureter gets blood supply from the kidney itself. So this part should not be dissected. And we need to take this, uh, why we are keeping in the kidney in the inguinal vein, the inguinal fossa, uh, is because that uh, we tend to make this uh, ureter as short as possible. If you tend to keep it a lot, there is high chance of stemia and the complications that can happen. So once we remove the kidney to the bench, we call it the bench surgery, then the blood inside the kidney needs to be washed, then the kidney is used, taken to the IC person for hypothermic storage. Uh, now we have to both the recipe and do the parallel. So our bone senior will not be longer, it will not be more than 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, initially we are using this Eurobolin solution, University of Wisconsin solution. Uh, for a flossing, but now we are using ringer lactic, which is very cheap. Uh, these are the few pictures, and uh, in the recipient's operations, I would like to highlight it that when we are uh, when we take the left kidney, uh, we usually keep that kidney to the right in the iliac fossa. Uh, there is reasons I will tell you why we keep that in the right side. Uh, we use the modified Gibson incision and the inguinal trees and the extra peritoneal approach is taken and we always anastomose that uh, renal artery and renal vein to the external iliac uh, artery and external iliac vein. So, why we choose that kidney to left kidney, RSV kidney to pass to the right one? So, uh, there is anatomical reasons because we know the relationship between this renal artery, and artery and the ureter. So, if you go from anterior to posterior, it's an artery, vein and ureter. It's a vein, sorry, it's a vein, artery and the ureter. So if you keep that kidney, pass the kidney on the left side, you have to keep pass in the same way. So artery will be anterior, vein will be anterior, vibrations will be anterior. But when you turn it to the right side, it's the ureter which comes first. Anteriorly we have the ureter. If we have other complication, the ureter complication or stone or anything in the future, we have always approach from anteriorly and if you keep on the right side, it's always easy to approach the ureter. So if we, if we keep it upside down, then there will be a problem. I told you that we anastomose the renal artery to the external iliac artery and renal vein to the external iliac vein. In some books, if you read the books, they always mention that um, you have to, uh, artery should be uh, anastomosed to the internal iliac artery. Yes, many people prefer that uh, internal iliac, they choose the first uh, option as internal iliac arteries, they dissect, um, ligating one internal, compromising one internal iliac artery is not a problem, but we are doing it with the external iliac. When using, uh, most of you have been learning in the vascular anesthesia, most is technique in CGBS, so there are two ways, some people are using two future from non techniques, uh, but now we are using, initially we use this technique for a few hundred of cases and then later we change our practice and we are using the same way the vascular surgeon has been with the single suture, single knob with the parasitic technique. Um, the electrovesical anastomosis is done with the modified laser technique and it is quite described. 
of women and venerable nurses to study. These are two of our um, pictures of renal transplantations where this uh, renal pain and renal artery has been anastomosed. This is one of the pictures where renal pain is anastomosed with external artery pain and the second picture after perfusion of the kidney. So, uh, I will take a few more minutes in the complication because this is also important. So, give me a few minutes time because I will just skip slightly. So in renal transplantation as in other surgeries, the complications are inevitable and you should be also be knowing about these complications. So there are two parts, donor complications and respiratory complications. I won't go into detail about the donor complications because this is same as other nephrectomies. But most of the times, we, some few traded uh, complications like uh, avulsion of renal arteries sometimes happens. But uh, this can be managed quite well. Urological complications after transplantation is about in around less than 5% of cases and it has the hair effect. We all know that. Why there is hair effect? Because there are lots of things. We know the better biological behavior, lots of good drugs, surgical techniques, disease states, they have come up. And when you are talking about these complications, uh, are, I, I always say that then you, I like to classify three, three forms. One is the wound related infections, that is same for everything. Chronic uh, kidney failure patients with a heavily compromised patient, they always tend to have own complications like usual. I particularly uh, describe the vascular complications that we, these are the complications that we have encountered in our institute in 500 cases. So, renal artery stenosis, renal artery thrombosis, graft person, brain thrombosis, these are the three complications that you should be knowing and you should know how to manage those cases. So, these few are the few of the pictures of renal artery stenosis and which was treated after percutaneous transplant luminal angioplasty with a stain and few of the urinary complications as I told you that the urinary stain is one of the important causes because if you tend to keep the urinary long or you try to fiddle up in this golden triangle sometimes this urinary get stained and so the patient can have a urinary leak or a stricture in the later post operative period so these are picture of the few of the patients we need to divert the kidney, then do anti integrate pyelography, um, and there were lots of pneumatic uh, semi and necrosis, and that was subsequently managed with Guadis uh, plan. So co complications like lymphoria and lymphocyte actually, actually exist, and this is because of the dissection of the lymphatics during the uh, vascular dissection. The complications like hematuria and graft ruptures are also. Uh, the last slide I, add, I would like to put forward is the mortality still. The transplantation is a very risky game because you are dealing with the uh, CKD patients and there are lots of comorbidities with the patients. So you know, this is our data is that about 3 to 4 percent of mortality that we encounter during the early first 30 days of our uh, post-operative period. And most of the times they die in the post-operative period because of uh, Delayed graft functioning with the sepsis, pulmonary embolism, urinary leak, and the sepsis, and the chronic graft rejection as well. So, finally, I would like to share this slide for the, to motivate the organ donations. And thank you so much for giving me your kidney. Hope your others want not to donate. So, we also need to encourage ourselves because now we don't have that policies, government policies, um, to start the volunteer work organ donations. We don't have the artistic donation program because now our legal legality has only fixed between the close relatives. So we are not giving this kidney to our uh, well wishes or the friends, but we are only donating to our 